Her lips are copper wire calling Jesus and box seat up for discussion today. Ah, oh, Gene Toomer knocking it out of the park again. Aren't you glad that we decided to read this one super in depth? It's my my choice on that, right? I, I did that? <laughs> sure, sure. We'll give you credit for that one. <laughs> so if you didn't notice, I am traveling this week. I am in Vegas. So welcome to our first official Vegas show. I guess this is kind of a big deal. Not everybody gets a Vegas show. <laughs> All right. Her lips are copper wire. This is probably, in terms of just titles, like if I had to pick, like, just read the titles, what were my favorite, this title is is clearly my favorite in this collection. It's one that just comes straight forward at you, and you kind of know what you're going to get from the beginning. And that's sometimes refreshing, especially in poetry for someone like a novice like me. I'm like, okay, I already have a vibe of what's to come, and that helps me feel a little bit more relaxed as I'm trying to go through a poem that, you know, I struggle with because for me, it, it's difficult to find that meaning and that that's refreshing. I love it. All right. So here's, here's a question for you. This is a good question for my history teacher here. I believe, I didn't look it up, but you know, when we talk about 1923 or, you know, early 1900s, we, we don't have power everywhere. Right. We've talked before when we did After the Race by James Joyce. There are clearly, I think, some parallels with those that have power tend to be a little bit more wealthy. Uh, obviously, we're moving further and further away from that. I mean, 1923 is, is, is we've had, you know, electricity for at least a couple decades in the States at this point in time. I think the White House had, what, 1891 or something like that. But we, I know for a fact, we did not hit FDR's, the, you know, Rural Electrification Act. And that was the one that brought, like, you know, power to, like, 85% of America. Yeah. 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 So, so we're still at a point where power, you know, electricity is still... A novelty. It's a novelty. It can be, it can be in the reserve of class, even to a certain extent. But at the same time, it represents progress. It, it represents forward motion. Right. As as the world drastically changes as electricity hits all the streets and all the houses. Right. And it's something I think it's kind of an unknown factor too. something that wows people because it's almost still like magic. I mean, you got to think that for thousands of years, humans had lived and died by the giant ball of fire in the sky and fire here down on Earth in, in candles or lamps or pieces of wood. So this is something that is sparking imagination this is something that gives you know new meaning to what is the possibilities and i love that that this poem kind of is that same thing it's that spark it's that liveliness of what can humans do next Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even to an extent when we're talking about city and rural right we have a lot of conversation with that going from georgia georgia up to the north in terms of to the big cities in terms of progress where is that happening in the big cities and such so uh, i think you have not read all of Kane yet, and I won't give away spoilers for the rest of Kane, but you're going to see continued conversations around this, around class, around that explosion and movement forward. So this is definitely kind of a, it's not obvious reading it like in a bubble by itself, but that's what makes Kane so powerful is that you can kind of extrapolate it over several stories. And it's worth pointing out for those that have read ahead or aren't aware that if you pay attention to when electricity is in a character's power or not, or whether we're in a rural versus the city area and what characters long for, you're going to see more of a class discussion in, in these later sections here. And power is a big part leading into that discussion is what I would say. I'm excited to read forward, obviously, because it's been so wonderful so far. But also, I think about like the music aspect of the 1920s and 30s, and then this idea of incorporating all of the the blues and jazz and electricity and power and class and uh, all the the issues that our country had. It, it's exciting to see where this novel is going to go because it just keeps getting better and better for me. Yeah. All right. So my one big point that I want to bring up for this poem is, you know, we talked, or actually, no, we didn't talk. You didn't make it to that one. There was one of uh, the poem discussions that I had that I don't think you were able to make it for that one, but I talked about how Du Bois said that this was a very important book in literature for the black community because it, it, it was the first to kind of explore black sexuality, 
to normalize it, to talk about it, because up until then it was completely repressed. It was it was a part of literature that was just absent. And don't you love that Toomer does this so elegantly that to take something that's so hush-hush, still to this day, we're a very young country, but sexuality and and anything of that nature is very, you know, taboo um, in general terms. And it, he breaks it down to something so simple as a kiss, and then it can be so impactful that that's all you need. And I think that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, there is this quote where he says, then your tongue remove the tape and press your lips to mine till they are incandescent. Why do you think she had tape over her mouth? I think this is the silencing of maybe um, black women and their sexuality and that they're finally going to have their voice heard and that they are going to they're, they're going to kiss and, and they're going to make this, you know, they're going to kiss so passionately and so long that they don't care what happens, who sees that it, it's finally over that, you know, oh, uh, you know, afraidness of it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's worth pointing out, too, that if we are talking about this being liberation, what's to be said about the fact that there's literally no punctuation in this poem at all? The fact that the expression is not limited by the confines of punctuality is, is punctuation is, is something that I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, I hadn't noticed that. Oh, I'll have to go back and read it now. I didn't even think yeah. about that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right, Calling Jesus, the second poem. This is the one where it's basically a big metaphor where the soul's the puppy, right? And, and you being a dog person, you <laughs> talked to me. You've, you've ripped into me before about how like, oh, Una, you're not a dog person. You don't understand what it means to just have a dog around, just, just to be there, to be a companion. You need it. It needs you. Tell me more about how this poem landed upon you. So a dog is man's best friend. And I think that friendship is important. Um, I think that when you look into those big eyes, you can see a soul, you can feel love. And I think, and there's com companionship. And I, I feel like that's really kind of what the poem was speaking to. Um, it kind of fell off for me a little bit. This might be the first time that I'm not gushing over a part of the, uh, the, the book so far, because I felt like this one was a little bit transition-y. I felt like it was just a way to move us towards box seat, um, the story arc of this uh, trilogy that we, you know, kind of chunk them into. I feel like, you know, if the first one is electric, explosive love, this is maybe like eternal love, devotional love, which tends to not be as exciting, but also maybe, maybe it's it's not as multidimensional, perhaps, as the other stories. And when I say that, not that his lyricism isn't great, not that the the, the subject matter isn't adorable and, and and really well written, but it doesn't tackle, I think, some of the social and consciousness problems. It, it tends to focus more just on like that uh, religious, you know, purpose of the soul. Which you know, if you if you didn't know that Gene Tumor wasn't a materialist, I, you're probably going to figure it out by now. And if not, you're going to figure it out by the next set of poems. But also, but also even the next set of poems, too, also continue to explore that idea of uh, consciousness, of what does society make me think, in a sense. So perhaps there'll be more value given to this as we continue to move forward. I do think that Cain is very much a interconnected theme. And we've been exploring... Social, the theme's not the right word there, but we've been exploring social consciousness. People have said this explores uh, the, the black mind. I, I, I think it is exploring identity. I think it is exploring awareness of where does myself begin and where does that reflection off society influence how I choose to present myself. I think we see romance and attraction questioned. I think we see racial influences and societal class problems come up. And this story lacks a lot of those dimensions, but I think it does ripple out, you'll see, over the next few stories. Right, because I think that uh, Her Lips Are Copper Wire and Calling Jesus are two sides to the same coin. One is the physical love, and one is uh, spiritual love, I guess, for mm. lack of better terms. Because mm. those things, I think, are very prevalent when we get to box seat in the story of Dan and and what does love and, and mean to him? Because he's all about physical 
and that might not be complete to have a healthy relationship. That's actually a really good point and great transition to box seat. So, <laughs> but, but this one, you, you almost got a little sense of forbidden love, like Romeo and Juliet, like you, you, you can't make that love work almost in a sense. And is it because of the physical love versus like that psychological? We, we got to explore that. Uh, box seat. So for someone out there that might not be used to perhaps what a box seat means, you want to explain that one? So if you go to a theater or a play, not modern uh, movie theaters, but like old school going to the orchestra or something like that, there are seats down below, um, like on the floor, and those were usually like the cheaper seats. And then you had the box seats, uh, which would be up, you know, second story. And those were traditionally kind of changed over time. In the beginning, it was for the rich people. And then it kind of flip-flopped to where the rich people... uh, i.e. a lot of times white people sat down on the floor and then people that were of color, they were relegated to the box seats uh, in the second floor. I think when we think of the theater too, just the theater in general, the the, the class consciousness has to come up, right? Of I, course. I, could, I, I always go back to that the Anna Karenina novel that we read and how there was like a social revelation when it came to being at the theater of who was who, who saw who. And even in this, you have, oh, that's Jim Clem on the piano and so-and-so. I can't remember his name in the <laughs> orchestra. Like there's there's an element of of prestige, of, of, of class difference to be cultured and such when it comes to these theaters. And the box seats, to your point, were a way of differentiating some of that difference. Uh, differentiating that difference of establishing a difference between uh, classes, if you will. And who you got to sit next to mattered as well. What time you got there mattered. Uh, you know, of course, then what happens when you go out to these these events? You dress up so you're in your best and you're going to show off your jewelry. Uh, it, it's all about class divide, clout, showing off and those things. And as we get into the story, we see that like, Poor Dan kind of breaks all the social norms that you would traditionally see at a, you know a playhouse or you know a movie theater back in the 1920s. Yeah, well, Dan. Okay, so he is a darker-skinned individual, as described by the narration, and he's heading to you know his girl's house that he's he's just infatuated with, right, Muriel? And she's staying. You know, she the house is kind of run by Mrs. Privy. So he's going through this neighborhood, and he knows already that in terms of like that that difference of him versus neighborhood. He's like, I don't belong here. And he goes into these fantasies about how he says, no, I ain't a baboon. I ain't Jack the Ripper. I'm a poor man out of work. Right? And he compares himself to some things that you know I don't think we would compare to today in terms of being a baboon. But he also has something that's very relevant today where he's afraid of being arrested just for being in that neighborhood and being a darker skin. Yeah, it doesn't get more real than that nowadays, right? Where people are racially profiled. And I mean, Dan kind of has a point that why couldn't he just be there? Uh, I mean, he's being judged before somebody knows him. And that would obviously, I think, anger anybody. So he already has kind of a chip on his shoulder from the very beginning of the story. And then it just kind of escalates from there because technically Meryl isn't really his girl. He's trying to get her to be his girl. Uh Do you think that Dan has any confusion? Confusion isn't the right word, but there's like in his mind, he's got a very creative fantasy that, that he imagines things. And in some ways there's kind of like a blurring effect of reality and fantasy. Do you think that he's a character that has one of those just super in touch experiences with reality? Or do you think that he goes overboard with guessing with what may happen? I think in the second one, I think that a lot of young men tend to become infatuated with women. My, I happen to me uh, and tell me if I'm wrong. Cause I, I don't know what, you know, your experience that with this fatuation, you start to create a narrative in your head um, of how things would look, how you're going to hang out and talk with each other, uh, this person that you have this infatuation with. 
what your first date's going to be like, what your first kiss is going to be like, and then you start going, you know, what is, what is our marriage going to look like? What are our kids going to be like? You just, you kind of take it too far and you build this whole persona of the person and this whole story of how your lives are going to be together. And then when it doesn't happen, you get angry because it was actually real to you. And maybe it was real, but it was only real in your mind. And so that disappointment leads you to lash out. And that's what Dan does throughout the story is lash out because he had put Muriel on a pedestal. He'd created this narrative for himself, uh, for themselves and then as it doesn't come to fruition, he gets, you know, bummed out. Wasn't it you, too, that also has told us at one point in time that when you're first courting someone, you are in love with the idea of the person rather than the actual person themselves, right? And I think Dan has an idea of what he wants this relationship to be because he's over there and he immediately brings up like this traumatic event. Like, oh, I'm sorry about that thing that pained you. And she wants to change the subject. She doesn't want to talk about it. She wants to be very pragmatic. She wants Dan to get a job. She wants him to work harder. And then as soon as his her friend comes over, B, she immediately kind of like shafts him and turns away from him. And there's, there's just a lot going on here, right? Because how do we view her? Is she pragmatic? Is she someone that gives in to social pressures the way that as soon as the color line is questioned with her friend coming over, that's probably white that she doesn't want to be seen with the darker skinned individual like Dan. There's a lot to it, you know, to interpret here. You don't know if this is coming off straight as racist because you don't get a lot of information, but it's heavily implied. And again, I think we're we're setting up to kind of feel sorry for Dan, but he doesn't go about I guess in a correct correct socially acceptable way of how to handle these situations. But how would he know this? I, he, he's a fi- it's almost a fish-out-of-water story, right? I mean, he, he's a, a Southern boy that is coming to the big city and being rejected just because of the way he looks, and then he's trying to build this relationship and being rejected again by the way he looks, indirectly by a friend. I mean, what do you expect out of this guy? And it, it's kind of heartbreaking. You know what I think it is? The... You'll notice that there's, it's almost kind of musical, the way that there's transitions in the scenes with Miss Privy flipping the newspaper, right? Like as soon as you find out some information, suddenly the newspaper, you know, ripples in the background and stuff like that. And, you know, what are newspapers, if not a form of social consciousness of these are the things that we care about? And it's every time that the, the newspapers, the Mrs. Privies of the world, who gatekeep people like Dan from visiting Ms. Muriel or the, the white friends and stuff like that. She is more responsive, I think, to social pressures than Dan is, who is more introspective. Like, he's creative. He has an uh, active imagination, clearly. He faces inward, while Muriel is facing outward for her information in terms of what society expects from her or what her friends expect her to behave as. This whole time you're reading this, you were playing a musical in your head, weren't you, where Mrs. Pribby did the newspaper, and she goes, that boy ain't good for you, and she started singing, and they started dancing in the kitchen. I I know that was in your head. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit. You know, tumor has got, got that rhythmic writing, and his writing is just so gorgeous, but I think it's worth us spending some time to reflect on how does tumor kind of paint each each race in throughout a lot of these stories. You know, we've, we've read a, a bunch at this point in time. But a lot of times you have black individuals who tend to be denigrated by society. You've got them being looked down upon. You've got them frequently feeling incomplete or questioning where they belong in society. And a lot of the white people, it's not like they're perfect either, right? You've got them that are, they're very, they're violent. They're power hungry. Right? They'll do anything to protect or dismiss anything that would challenge that power as well. That I think that you have a lot of narrative energy that is not just, I don't think these are fair or realistic, and I don't think they're meant to intended to be realistic depictions of the race. I think what we're seeing is Tumor is using each race to reflect off of the other one all, all the things that they think about themselves. So when the white people are being denigrating or power hungry or dismissive or when the black people are questioning their own identity or questioning their own values, you see how the characters are impacted negatively by like this, you know, this consciousness of what the other thinks of them. 
So I think that takes us to the second half of the story, so to speak, is where he finally kind of gets to go on the date with her, but not directly because she shuns him again. And like, well, I'm going to go to the theater and you shouldn't go. But he goes anyway because Dan is persistent and we see that they don't get to sit together. And now it comes into play where the title of the story box seat starts to make a little bit more sense as they get to the theater and where Dan has to sit in relation to Mariel and her friend. Did you get any sense of Dan representing kind of like the old Southern way of the, the class distinction and the way that this theater is split, right? And as soon as he enters into the room, like there's this feeling of does this, this man belong here? You know, does he deserve to be here? Does, does he earn, has he earned his way into this form of society? And Muriel is almost kind of like that newer New South mentality of, of building your own way, making your own choices, and, and creating your own uh, wealth, if you will. For sure. Yeah, I think that that is a perfect way to describe it. I think this is the part of the story where if you had not had the context of why Dan is so upset, or maybe um, you hadn't picked up on the clues of the differences between Mario and Dan and their outlooks on life, and maybe their mentalities of how times are changing then this is the part where you would you would see Dan as the bad guy. Does he make some inappropriate choices? I think so. But you can still kind of sympathize with him that he has been mistreated in the first part of the story to not necessarily justify his actions, but I don't think can completely condone his actions either. I always wondered what he saw in Muriel. Like, it's not really clear why he desires her other than some type of a drive. Almost, I feel like he's almost proving himself for some reason against others for why he chooses her. Because, you know, we, we move into the play. There's the first act, the second act with the doors. And, you know, we have the, the Mr. or whatever his name was, Murray or something like that, that was handing out the rose. And when he goes to hand the rose to his chick, Muriel, that's when he stands up and says, Jesus was a leaper, right? Like, stopping the whole play and, and, and to your point he, he was stepping on people's toes and upsetting people like he clearly was an agitator at this event do you think that what do you think what do you think him standing up and yelling that meant i think it comes back to not only the rose and that you know somebody is you know kind of hitting on his girl or who he thinks is his girl in his mind but it also comes back to something that you talked about before with what I one of the major themes of the whole poem is is the black sexuality here because if you go to the play and the dwarfs and them kind of fighting and boxing and stuff, it reminds me of another story about a boxing ring, Battle Royale, and there was a lot of sexual tension there. And I, I think that Tumor may be putting a little bit of sexual tension in here of, you know, that bloodlust and the fighting. And this is this is getting, you know, Dan riled up. And then he sees somebody, you know, macking on his girl. Uh, you know, what's the first what have we said so many times on this channel? There are kind of two ways to communicate your words and your fists. And Dan, not really knowing how to, you know, communicate well, he's gonna resort to violence. And I, I think that he he's lashing out because he doesn't know any other way to communicate his feelings towards Muriel. Do you think, you know, we talked earlier about how Dan has this blending of fantasy and reality. It's not, it's not reality that something's happening with Muriel, most likely with this Rose, like it's just part of the performance, but he's unable to discern the difference. He allows his imagination and fantasy to override his understanding or maybe even expectations of reality. You know, is Dan one of those people that needs to, perhaps if he is too intrinsic, to allow, to allow his fantasies to run away with things? What's, what's the better option for Dan? Does he need to improve his listening? Does he need to improve his awareness of the external? Or is it the outside world's what's corrupt? Like, what's, who, who's in the wrong here? That's a tough question to answer. Uh, I don't think there's a right answer here. I mean, obviously, had he been cool, calm, and collected, and he's like, oh, it's nothing, you know, that's just part of the thing. He, he you know, Muriel will never really go with that guy or anything. 
maybe that would show a softer side to him, a more understanding, empathetic side, and maybe that would have been something that could have bonded Dan and Muriel together. I don't know, but I, I do think that this is something that shows the immaturity, and that's something that is, uh, I, I think, prevalent a lot through this is that our society as a whole um, is maturing, is changing. And Dan kind of represents all of that, of the old ways of doing things, of violence is not going to work anymore, that if you want to build relationships, there has to be tolerance, there has to be understanding, there has to be communication. And, and that's something that Dan will need to work at if he wants to forge a, uh, you know, a fruitful relationship with anybody, let alone Muriel. That's a good point. That's a good point. So he uh, kind of challenges this guy that he honks his nose, Mr. Miyagi style. (laughs) 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 Got your nose, guy. (laughs) They they decide to go out in the alley, and he just walks away. Right? And I I was curious. I I don't know if this is a term I'm unfamiliar with, but instead of going into the back alley, they went into the black alley. Is that a term I should know? I, I don't know what black alley meant, or I didn't know if I was meant to pick up on it from like a racial consciousness perspective. I think the second one again there, I think this is a, a clear little dig by Toomer that this is something, because imagine a theater, again, we've talked about the class divide. We haven't really talked about the racial divide maybe in a theater. Uh, think of like a courtroom back in this time period. There would have been an area for white people, and then there would have been an area for everybody else to sit. There have also been different entrances and exits, remember? Different bathrooms, different drinking fountains. So if you had had the entrance for maybe uh, uh, the white people to go out, there would have been the the entrance and exit for everyone else, and that may have become like a derogatory term of where all the people of color would have been going in and out of. It may have gained that, you know, as the black alley because that would have been their entrance and exit, So, which mm. is heartbreaking, right? Mm. Yeah, no, this is... This is, man, I love Kane. This is a series that keeps on giving. Up next, we have Bonham and Paul, which I think explores the best this problem of how we perceive ourselves versus society and what a society expects of us. And then we have mm. Cabness, which is like a 60-page play adapted to a short story. It is, it's heart-wrenching. Like, steal yourself before you read that one, but... Man, I'm telling you, <laughs> Kane, okay. Kane just, it just, it's just so good. It's just so good. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it anymore. The gift that keeps on giving. Yes, sir. I'm excited for it. All right. Playlist down below of other Kane talks. Looking forward to finishing this and wrapping this up. What's been your favorite piece of this book collection, short story cycle collection, if you will? My name is Ben Una. We'll talk to you later. Peace. Peace.